Um, because it's you, I showed up, but my wife is uh, giving birth right now, so I showed up for you. I'm just totally kidding with you. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was going to actually shut down the call. If that's the case, you know? What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Life is fast and full of opportunity. All right, we're keeping that in there. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I am very excited today. We have Greg McEwen, who's author of the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. Now, Greg, many past interviewees, including Brian Kurtz, tout this as one of their favorite books of all time. And just to demonstrate the effect of your message on these serious entrepreneurs, I spoke to Brian this morning. I know this is one of his favorite books. I'm like, what, what do you think I should ask Greg? And he said, and, Gre- and by the way, you know, Brian helped Boardroom Inc. grow to a $150 million company. And he said to me, Greg, he felt like a schoolgirl when he met you at the Genius Network event. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said, can a- I say that on the interview? He said, no problem. So... You know, I'm it's a nice master- compliment. Yeah, it's a compliment. Yeah, it's, I'm, it's a slight. It's a slightly scary compliment. <laughs> it is scary. So I'm in his mastermind, and he gave your book to everyone. I know he's bought over hundred copies of your book to give out. And just to mention, Greg, Greg's spoken at companies like Apple, Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Pixar, Salesforce, just to name a few. And this is also one of my favorite books. If you answer yes to any of these questions, then this book is a must for you. And that's why I've listened to it many times. And how have you ever found yourself stretched too thin? Check for me, yes. Does your day sometimes get hijacked by someone else's agenda? Check, yes. Have you ever said yes simply to please and then resented it? Now, Greg has dedicated his career to discovering why some people break through to the next level and why others don't. Greg, thanks for joining me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Yeah. So answer that question first. Why do some people break through to the next level and others don't? Well, I noticed the phenomenon at first working with super successful, yeah. uh, driven uh, executive teams in Silicon Valley. And I, I, I noticed that there was uh, this pattern. When they were focused on the right few things at the right time, they could generate tremendous momentum. Uh, as they all, you know, the whole team can coalesce together and just make something happen. So that's great. And that's to be expected. But then, you know, what what did it lead to? Success, right? That is also quite logical. Um, And what came with the success? Uh, Options and opportunities. Now, that sounds like the right problem to have, but it does, in fact, uh, turn out to be a problem if it leads to what Jim Collins has called uh, the undisciplined pursuit of more. Mm. And, and and that really, if you get pulled into the undisciplined pursuit of more, then it can undermine the very things that led to success in the first place. And so, uh, you know, I am uh, maybe exaggerating in order to make this point, but success can become a catalyst for failure. Uh, and so, so the whole of essentialism, the uh, the, the book, but also behind it, the, the movement, the company, uh, all of it is trying to address that particular challenge. It's the antidote to that challenge. Yeah. The, the antidote is the, the disciplined pursuit of less but better. Yeah. And I like the word discipline. How do you stay focused? You know, I was talking to an entrepreneur the other day. Um, I was talking to Dan Cashel, CEO of the Genius Network, actually, and we were chatting and he was, we were joking around that we were saying, why did this person stop doing this part of their business? And he just kind of laughed and said, you know, we're entrepreneurs. It was working too well and we got bored of it. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> how do you stay focused on essentialism, essentially? What do you tell well, entrepreneurs? Well, I mean, I, I think that the idea is to, is to become really selective. Uh, not 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 a little more selective, really selective. So you think about uh, your closet, yeah. and 
Uh, the average closet has a ton of stuff in it. It's, it's sort of overloaded. Uh, and then eventually somebody says, well, listen, it's, I'm just fed up with this. I'm going to organize my closet. Mm -hmm. But in the moment of taking something off the shelf, something, something magical happens. Uh, something mysterious happens. Not magical. No, that's wrong. Mysterious. Because it's suddenly, we, we think, well, maybe, maybe I want to, maybe, maybe it will come back into fashion again one day. Or maybe it will fit me again one day. And right. the problem is, is that this, this approach means that that thing goes back on the shelf. But, but using that criteria, we don't know we're using criteria, but using that criteria is so broad that everything is a yes. I mean, the question we're asking is, could this ever be useful to me ever again in the future? Possibly. Yeah. Well, of course, the answer is yes to everything. And so it, we don't get rid of anything. So I'm putting to people that the solution to that in a closet is become incredibly, you say, you ask, do I love it? Do I wear it often? Uh, I mean, right. recently, the question has become popular, a very essentialist question, which is, does it spark joy? Mm -hmm. Does this item spark joy for me? And if the answer is no, then you pass it on or give it away or yeah. throw it away. The, the same approach, I think, can be applied to life. Yeah. Uh, it was said by David Sivers in a, in a fabulous uh, blog piece. Uh, he, he, said, he said, no more yes. It's either hell yeah or no. Yeah. And that is a very different criteria in life. That is, that is a very particular approach. And I think it is the approach that has the power of relevancy now. Yeah. You know, one thing that makes me think of it, I ask you that because I'm like, you know, I'm thinking in my mind, is Greg get bored of talking about essentialism all day long, every single day? And then I remember what you told me before we got on and you're like, well, you have essential live now. So what is essential live? Well, we got a call. This was literally like three or four weeks ago. Get a call from somebody that just really sparked some thoughts about trying to launch a social experiment for a year mm -hmm. and uh, and like, you know, trying to take on like the whole city of L.A. or, you know, the whole of Silicon Valley or, be or even beyond. And it just got our imagination going about what is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've spent the, the, the book came out about a year and a half ago. We spent the last year and a half you know, doing a lot of interesting work with a lot of interesting companies and conferences. And and, and we hold a very um, you know, a very, I hate the word elite, so I don't want to really use that word, but, right. but, but, but really selective group of executives comes together yeah. to sort of strive to become essentialists and we hold it in Napa Valley, uh, in California. Right. Okay, great. But what about everybody else? Like, and when I say everybody, I just mean students. I mean, students like uh, eight year olds, yeah. uh, middle school students, high school students, college students. Uh, every kind of leader in every kind of organization or in no organization at all, how could you help everybody to create space yeah. to design their most essential life? Mm -hmm. And so we just, we just began. Uh, and, and we've, I, I, I'm candid to say that we're, uh, I don't know, we're, we're, we're bold enough to be rubbish if necessary. <laughs> uh, we, we don't, we don't know how to, really have a social movement of the kind that we are describing now yeah. uh, we don't know how to do it and maybe we'll fail completely but yeah. so far it's been electric to watch people respond to watch people of every kind of demographic uh, want to be involved and, and and i don't want to give away too much but but the, the most recent conversations we've been having i think are very exciting for how we could imagine yeah. telling the stories of these people um and and, and that's that's important that's that's i think a mistake i made early on um, over the last year or two, which is and what? something. Well, well, I mean, if you go to if you go to my website, right? If you go to gregmcewan.com, yeah, you find, I mean, hopefully, a perfectly reasonable website. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, nothing nothing terribly bad about that website. But here's the problem: is both the name and the and and the way it's designed. The camera's on me. Right. It's the site is Greg and, yeah. and like almost every other, you know, thought leader, uh, that's that's what the site is. I and see. of course, you try to put the camera onto the ideas. But what I want to do uh, over this year is turn yeah. the camera completely around and put it on and tell the stories yeah. of these extraordinarily compelling stories of people who are yeah. grappling with essentialism, yeah. the successes, the failures, all of it. Yeah. Uh, so our latest idea with this, I mean, this is completely hot off the press, but is, yeah. is that we want to 
uh, we're going to have people, uh, anyone who wants to be involved with it, will will keep a documentary diary about their experiences for the year. Hmm. Uh, ups, downs, middle, everything. Yeah. I mean, I, you should do it. I really think so. Yeah. Uh, if, it, if it sounds like something that yeah. would, would interest you. And everybody who's, who's part of this conversation yeah. today should I mean, you talk too. about in your book how you journal, how you create that space too. Right. Yeah. I, I do, and I think that I think that that's that's one of the, the the few traditions in my life I'm just like absolutely adamant not mm. to lose, no matter what. So I did it last night. You know, I do it every night. Same time uh, every night. Yeah, I do it. I mean, it's not like a set time. It's just the last thing I do before mm. I go to sleep. Yeah. Um, so that can be that can be different, but I I, I, I don't I don't miss it. So yeah. it's been uh, I've hardly missed it. I don't think I have missed a day in probably the last four and a half years. Wow. But but I certainly haven't missed many in the last decade. Uh, and and to, to, to me, this the idea of not just not just living, but pausing to think about living yeah. is really important. I remember a friend uh, once said to me, uh, they said, that, oh, Greg, I was asking them some question. You can imagine this it might be a bit irritating to have a friend <laughs> who's an aspiring essentialist. Uh, <laughs> but I was asking them, I was asking them some question. And they said that they said, oh, Greg, I'm too busy living to think about life. Uh, that's interesting I, yeah right I thought that was just a fabulous one liner that I wanted to sort of hold on to forever after that uh, it, I think a lot of us feel like that today mm. uh, even if we wouldn't say it yeah. uh, as clearly as that and so I, I think there's a way to have a lot of people start to become more conscious of the choices they're making of the options that are before them and, and how they're choosing to utilize these finite resources of time yeah. and energy and yeah. so on uh, in a way that could inspire, uh, you know, could inspire a generation, and uh, and so uh, we are we are boldly trying to do this. So where can people check out Essential Live? Well, right now they just can go to essentiallive.tv. TV. Okay. That's sort of a. I mean, we just put up the landing page just barely. Uh, I mean, it's all. It's a little bit like on the walls of Facebook. There's one of the quotes there that says, uh, "It says done is better than." perfect yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and 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 it, and it strains me a little bit because I, I like to it's not like perfect to, yet I, well I, I, I'm not, I don't aspire to be a perfectionist at all but I do I do aspire to less but better and so there is a tension between that and just getting things done right uh, but we're definitely in the mode of getting things done with this and uh, we've just uh, we, we, we're we're in conversation partnering yeah. with uh, with a, a, a documentary uh, film uh, filmmaker uh to help us to do this and to tell this awesome yeah. story we, every person has a story to tell and i think sure. that essentialism is really not about essentialism essentialism is about people becoming more of who they are and less of who they aren't yeah and i think it would be just really fascinating to watch people grapple with that over a year's period of time, to yeah. be able to see the struggles, the ups and downs, the decisions, and all of that, uh, that I think is so is so real for for almost all of us today. Yeah. So, Greg, what was interesting in your journal when you look back? I know you look back, uh, whatever, over ninety days or so, on mm -hmm. what that looks like. What was something interesting that you found from what you wrote in the past? The the, the thing that always surprises me, which yeah. is must make me especially forgetful because it, it really is the thing every 90 days I'm like wow is how much progress has been made hmm. uh, I I struggle I struggle with um, with being so aspirational to achieve certain things yeah uh, that I can feel the the gap between where I am right now and what it is I would really like hmm. to contribute to the world yeah. and and if you're not careful you can you can feel I mean, I can feel, not you, I can feel yeah. quite frustrated you know uh, by that. Yeah. Uh, and, so, and so for me, one of, the reasons I, one of the reasons I keep a journal is that every day at the end of the day, I get to at least express some gratitude for, look, look at the progress that was made today. And when you extrapolate that every 90 days, I, I go through a journal almost exactly yeah. every 90 days. I don't try to do that, but that happens to be the, the tenure. So every time I'm done, I go through and read through not word for word, but just flick through all, the, whole, the whole journal, yeah. and I make a list of like the big things, the big items of progress, and I'm I'm always struck yeah. by how much progress there's been, and I think that's true for a lot of people that 
that they can feel like they're not they're not winning as often as they actually are winning. That they're, yeah. they're not doing as well as they actually are doing because we're just living in this moment to moment. It's like our memory has been shrunk to the the the, the literally like email to email just right. how long it takes to go check the phone to the time you check the phone again and if something amazing hasn't happened in the last two minutes then we feel like we might be failing we need a life. quick fix yeah exactly and uh and so so that is always the thing that that grabs me yeah and so greg you know we were talking about a fun fact about you and one thing you would never do people have asked you yeah right <laughs> the first time that somebody asked me that question my, my instant reaction was listen to the stones I'm a, <laughs> I'm a Beatles, I'm a Beatles man to the core. So that, that's it. That's it. Uh, that's the only thing yeah, you would that, never do. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a little, that sounds a little freakish that too, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> there's probably a lot of things I would never do, but that's one okay. fun thing, fun fact. So it all started when you were in law school, right? What happened? Right. Well, I, I, a friend of mine, Sean Vanderhoeven, called me and he said listen I want you to come to my wedding and I was in England at the time and he's in Colorado and uh and he sent me tickets so I felt you know very obliged to go and also very excited to go and so while I was physically so far away from home somebody mentioned to me in passing you know oh if you do decide to stay in America then you should you know do whatever uh and it was the if that grabbed my attention like there's an option Mm, right because i think i think in life people know in their minds okay you you do have a choice but often people do not feel they have a choice and so in practical terms they they, it's as if they don't and so suddenly there was permission permission to think about things and so i I remember brainstorming look what would you do if you could do anything literally on a piece of paper making this brainstorm 20 minutes and afterwards i look at the piece of paper and what i notice is not what is on the list but what is not on the list in law school is not on the list, yeah. which was a problem because uh, at the time I was at law school. Right. So what do you do? And I, I call the, uh, the 15 digit number back to England and uh, my mother answers, fortunately. Uh, <laughs> Your dad says, would ring uh, you out? She says, uh, she, she listened for a while and she said, I think you better talk to dad. <laughs> so he comes on the phone. Now, what would you say? Not a rhetorical question. What would you say yeah. to your son after all that time, all that money, all that effort, he's halfway across the world, yeah. and he calls up, hey, listen, I'm thinking about quitting law school. What are you going to say? I would say, I told you not to go to law school. Why didn't you listen <laughs> to me? <laughs> yeah, he didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he listens, he listens and, then, and then he says, he says, son, he says, you know what we've always told you? And by the way, like what he's always told me is go to law school. Uh, <laughs> so he said the opposite. Apparently. Of <laughs> and then, no, he says, he says, he, he qu- you know, because all Englishmen quote Shakespeare over tea and crumpets for breakfast in the morning. Just the stereotype, yeah. And he, he says, uh, he says, you know, I was to, he says, uh, to thine own self be true, uh, which is in Hamlet. It's, 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 Le- it's, uh, it's Polonius talking to his son Laertes anyway. Uh, well, he'd never said that to me in his whole life. Uh, but nevertheless... <laughs> Uh, at, You're like uh, you should have told me that before you went to law school, or, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or thought somewhere about that. It. Should, yeah, and uh, and so that was it. I, I quit law school, um, and you just and quit right then. Like what was I did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that was in all sorts of ways. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was literally uh, at the beginning of essentialism in my in my life. Yeah. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't have that word, that language, or that framework. Yeah. But but it, it it has always left in me mm-hmm. this. Uh, this, I think, increased awareness. Sometimes yeah. you still forget, but this this generally increased awareness of you yeah. you don't have to. Yeah. Um, and so that was that. How was far really, along were you into law school at that point? Uh, almost the first year. Okay. Uh, finished. So I hadn't done the final exams from the first year, yeah. but but still. If you're like, I want to get out of these final exams. Done. Quit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm I'm sure that was part of it <laughs> when I think back to it. Uh, but I certainly I certainly recognize this isn't. I'm not loving this, but yeah. for me, I had the the benefit, the blessing of being so far away from it, and and yeah. I think that's one of the keys was that I was physically so removed in a different geography, and this other things seemed possible. Yeah. Um. And and sometimes I think in our day to day lives, it's very hard to do. This was really where I, I I I had only a vague sense at the time, but 
but uh, that I wanted to teach and write. So in a way, I've, I've described this, and I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be uh, participate in hyperbole here, but but I suddenly felt like, oh, maybe maybe I need to be a bit of a messenger in my life somehow. Mm. That mm. that's that there's a that there's something. To you knew teach, there was something there's something, there. there's something. But it took me years and years to feel like I had discovered what that message was. Yeah. Um, and and that's that's really the the second chapter of the yeah. story. Yeah. Uh, is that. Um, so I, I continued. I, I had taught, had write, uh, written, I um, co-authored, you know, books, and so. Uh, and then, and then I remember uh, one of my colleagues at the time uh, emailed me and said Friday would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby because I need you to be at this client meeting. Right. Uh, right. I mean, she was expecting. Otherwise, that would have been an even odder email to send. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Friday comes along, and that is when uh, my wife goes into labor, and yeah. we're in the hospital, and the baby is born. So wife and baby are, are, are well, and I'm there. But instead of being able to just enjoy yeah. the yeah. experience and yeah. be totally focused on it, yeah. uh, I, I feel like I'm being pulled in both directions, and yeah. I have to do both. How can I keep both happy? And to my shame, I went to the meeting, uh, and uh, I remember afterwards, my colleague said that, that the client will respect you for the choice you just made. Um, and I don't know that they did. But even if they did, I had made a fool's bargain. And that yeah. was really where I learned the, the, the message. Uh, the, the thing I needed to sort of give my yeah. professional life to was this simple idea. If you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. Yeah. And that was the, after that, that was a second story of quitting, right? First is law, quitting law school. I quit my job mm. uh, and launched uh, This Inc., which is uh, an organization yeah. committed to uh, helping, enabling people everywhere yeah. uh, to develop the mindset, the skill set, and the tool set yeah. to live and lead as an essentialist. Yeah. That's the mission. That's yeah. the message. Yeah, and Greg, that, that story in the book really hit home for me. Um, mm. with uh, the pregnancy and the person said, oh yeah, the, they'll respect you for it. And I feel like the fool's bargain is sometimes with ourselves. Like I struggle, that, like, I may have been both of those parties personally, right? The boss saying to myself, yeah. you know what I mean? So how do we internally, it's not even external, it's internal for me saying, well, I, you know, they'll respect me for doing that. I'm almost saying that to myself in this situation. <laughs> Well, you're bound yeah. to be. You're bound to be because I mean, because we've been sold this idea very deeply for a very long time, and so I think that I think that we're in a state right now that isn't just it, it isn't just well, individually, I have to choose to live a certain life. It's the the culture of our times is the undisciplined pursuit of more. Right. That that is that is the norm. Right. And so the opposite I mean, I, of your subtitle. The opposite yeah, of your I, subtitle. Yeah, I absolutely, and I think yeah. this is this is more true than I even realized when I wrote the book. Yeah, uh, it is that just people everywhere in all levels of organizations, or none at all, yeah. feel this sense, a certain, uh, oh, I don't know, a certain madness. I just go if I. But here's the idea. Here's what's been peddled. Yeah, is if I can fit it all in, then I can have it all. Right. And in fact, when people hear that, it's almost, it has a truth in us about it. Uh, as if, yes, okay, that is right. I just shovel more coal and I can have everything I want. Right. Uh, but the, the, the problem is that it, in fact, isn't true. It has that inconvenience. It's a lie. Uh, it's, so we've been sold a bill of goods. And, and, and unfortunately, the, the behavior that follows that, yeah. uh, that false but dominant assumption yeah. is to sleep less, work more, yeah. you know, just do more stuff. Yeah. Uh, it leaves people being exhausted. It certainly leaves them feeling um, sort of slightly meaningless. Yeah. Maybe not even yeah. slightly, but meaningless activity. Uh, and so, and so, I think the, the 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 key is first naming this phenomenon. This is non-essentialism. Yeah. It, it's a, it's, a, it's a whole way of living. It has a yeah. whole set of uh, of behaviors and beliefs. Yeah. And as soon as we name it, we start to realize how much of it. Has become internalized. It's it's almost like a it's almost like an air pollution. 
that we're all breathing in all the time. Right. And you start to start to suddenly wake up and you're like, my goodness, I, I really do think this way now. I do believe yeah. this. I do think yeah. that if I sleep one hour less, that's like I'm going to get an hour more productivity. Um, never mind that what that actually does is, is drive our discernment down. Yeah. Um, yeah. I suggest anyone, you know, part of the book with this one story with the uh, exe- high level executive with the micro lending is a phenomenal story. So I would, for that point, I urge everyone in essentialism to look out for that particular story because you, you map that out from everything we've all thought about getting less sleep, doing more, mm-hmm. and just runs them into the ground. So I tell people, you know, definitely listen to that part or, or read it if you're reading it. Um, there's a couple things, and you mentioned a few things, which is really interesting. I'm really curious how you named this movement, but I have to ask, go back in a second, because one thing you talk about is if, right? That going back to that person's question, they said if, and you you realize you have a choice. So I was thinking when I read it, or listened to it, um, when does this not apply? And for me, I was thinking, I want to ask you this question. Raising kids, okay, I want to make sure that they my two kids, I know you have kids, embrace the if, you have choices. But then sometimes with raising them, you don't want to give them a choice when you're disciplining or doing certain things. So I'm curious of how you have your kids apply uh, essentialism. Um, I mean, there's, there's, this is a, there's a, that's a, that's a, a bunch of different stories that come into yeah. my mind right yeah. now of, of, of this. Yeah. Uh, but I think I'll just start by saying, you know, we do care about teaching essentialism to our children. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, but, but, but not not preaching about it all the time. But, uh, but I mean, certainly all my children have heard me say, and probably too often, uh, look, yes, we could do that, but there's a trade-off. Yeah. Um, let me tell you one thing we've done that I yeah. think is I'd love has, to hear how you bake is, this is, in. Is interesting application. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so with. In terms of giving a children an allowance, so so yeah. we do we we've thought about that both ways. Should you give an allowance? Shouldn't you? We came down on the idea of yes. Why? Because we think that this is a good way for them to start very young, to uh, to make choices, yeah, and to be allowed to experience the consequences of those choices, yeah, and um, and so they they each have three mason jars. Mm-hmm. One is for charity, for giving, mm-hmm. and so the, we, we encourage them to tithe. Uh, one is for savings, yeah. uh, they can save as much as they like, yeah. uh, and uh, and then one is for spending. Yeah. And again, they can distribute this as as they choose. Yeah. Uh, and and as we've gone through this ex- experience, I had one of my uh, my, my children. Said uh, said they they really wanted to buy a certain thing, a certain Legos, you know, toy, and they saved up and they got enough money and they bought it, uh, and then a, a few weeks later, and they used it and they loved it. But a few weeks later, there was a different uh, Legos ish toy that cost more, and they couldn't afford to buy that because they bought the thing mm. two or three weeks before. Right, and and it really like you know upset them a bit, and I have to admit, loving this moment. Uh, not loving that they're upset, <laughs> but loving that they have uh, to grapple with the trade-offs. And, right. you know, and we were able to talk through it. It so really hits home. Challenge. Yeah, yeah. It, you've got finite resources in life. Yeah. So how do you choose where you're going to save and what you're you're not going to save? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the the outcome of that story. I mean, it's all ongoing, right? Children are it's a chaotic every process day. And yeah. Every day, it's like the ultimate startup. Yeah. Uh, is never any. Di- it's never the same one day. After, you know, after the next. Right. But the outcome of that particular story is that they then took, they did save enough money for that toy they wanted, but they chose instead to put it into long-term savings, yeah. uh, which is a pretty big deal because long-term savings for us means like you can only, all they can do with their long-term savings is buy a car or go, or like college. It's like there's like right. two or three things that they're saving. Not for. law school. Um, <laughs> not law school. No, I'm not anti-law school at all. <laughs> I, I, I think there are some lawyers that fantastically Just should be there. Just not for you. Yeah. Um, not for us. Yeah. Uh, so that's one practical way. Yeah. But you saying that though, I can riff on that for a moment because because more broadly, that is the the goal for our children is how to help them to be able to find their essential and unique right. mission in life. Right. Right. Uh, we we just we just. Everyone always has a uh, always has an emotional reaction to this, but we chose to. Yeah. We just chose recently, about 18 months ago, started homeschooling our two eldest. Mm. Um, and we never expected to do that. Actually, it, it was as a result. Uh, so uh, it, now they are almost 13 and, and almost 12. Okay. Uh, 
so this is middle school. Yeah. Instead of going to middle school, the, 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 we did one child and then we did the other. And it was as a result of talking to the person you mentioned earlier on, uh, the story of the microloan, uh, mm. the protect, protect really? the asset story. Yeah. So, so I, I know the, the person in question quite well. And when, yeah. they, when they took time off because of the fatigue, they ended up homeschooling because they wanted to go somewhere that was, they went, they went to France, if mm. you recall. And, yeah. and, uh, and, and they were just creating space and they created it yeah. together. And they read an, a few book, books when they recommended those books to us. We read them yeah. and we found ourselves really curious about yeah. what you could do if you were helping your children right from an early age yeah. grapple with the questions that yeah. typically people only grapple with at 30 yeah. or in the midlife crisis in 40 or something, which is, oh, yeah. what to, what should I do with my life? Yeah. Uh, and so as a result, over the last year, a year and a half, you know, our oldest two children are facing those questions just automatically right. because they're not being told exactly what they have to do with every minute of their mm. school day right uh and and it's very enjoyable to yeah. watch this and to and to try my wife does a terrific job at this creating a nurtured environment where they can just keep exploring this yeah um and and i i, I it comes back to the social movement i yeah. i just believe people actually have a human right to design a life that they see as being meaningful, one yeah. that matters. Yeah. Uh, and despite that being the case, and despite most people agreeing with that, it, as soon as they hear that, yeah. it isn't what is done. You know, how much time is spent with children in a, a traditional school yeah. focused on that question? Yeah. Ask, how, how old are you before you start asking the question, what's my highest point of contribution? Uh, I mean, yeah. pretty much that doesn't happen. That pretty much doesn't happen. Maybe a bit in college, but... But yeah. you know, you, you, then you're in a job, and you and 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 I think that life. You're too busy people, living life to think about it. Yeah, it is. I think. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a movement here in in uh, locally in, in the Bay Area called um, uh, Race to Nowhere. The yeah. Race to Nowhere. Yeah. And this there's, there's the risk of this, right? That you have children who go to school, to take exams, to go to college, to get a job, to to what, uh, to what end? Right. And uh, and and I think that we we could start much much earlier. Yeah. I don't know if you had a chance to talk with Jim Shields. I think he's a member of the 25K Genius Network where you spoke, but he talks, he has a company. I interviewed him and he, all the whole conversation on raising entrepreneurs, uh, mm. raising you know independent thinkers more. And they have a company that, uh, well, I'll send it to you if you, you like it, you could, you could look at it, but they have a, they homeschool and they have this whole methodology. It's interesting I'd as love well. To see it. Yeah. yeah. Send it to me. And what are the books that you, they recommend? So, I mean, the one I just read and we had a, a meeting about is at the opposite of spoiled, which sounds similar to the Mason jars. Um, I was, I was going to mention that it's yeah. exactly where we got the idea from yeah. for the Mason jars is yeah. the opposite of spoiled. I love that book. Yeah. So what were the other books you said? The person, uh, executive suggested a couple books. Do you remember any of them, or and you're looking at me like no? <laughs> <laughs> you're not allowed to ask that question. I can't remember. Um, so uh, no. it's okay. We, I if, can't remember. Yeah, so. it's okay. But I know the opposite of spoiled was a fantastic one. Um, and so back. So to the, I thank you for talking about that. I wanted you to riff on the kids for a little bit because I think it's, when it comes down to it, that's essentialism, right? You want to make sure you have that space for your family, you know, and. And for those events, like you said, you gotta, we got to be done in 11 minutes because you have a event that you have to go with your children, which is the most important and the priority. Um, right. So the naming, how do you decide what to call this movement? When did you, when did you fixate on essentialism? You know, I actually appreciate that question. I went through a very long naming process. Yeah. I'm big about words um, because, because without words, without naming something, you can't talk about it right. in the most literal practical sense you can't talk about it yeah. you can't talk about non-essentialism unless you have a word for it right you can't you can't say hey, i want to be an essentialist unless you have the word and so on and so i went through yeah tell I mean, me about some of them what are some of the chopping black ones oh, yeah oh my that's a that's a great question i'd have to look those back up now but uh you know um i want to hear your about, thought process with this greg yeah what yeah i, I mean we had um i mean every kind of and every kind of description with ist or ism afterwards uh so so instead of non-essentialist uh, we had trivialist at one point we mm -hmm. had uh, we had everythingist mm -hmm. um on the essentialist side uh i mean for, I, I, I mean I, I will say this that there was a key moment in the in the 
in the writing pro not writing process in the decision process where I was choosing between two books uh, I wanted to write, um, and one was about um, leadership by design, mm -hmm. which I really liked the idea of. In fact, it was quite a fully developed book design. Uh, Does it go then, off of multipliers? I mean, was it like it, well, uh, it, like a it, like a sequel to multipliers it, or? And, um, Not really. I, the, the, it was one of that was one of the reasons because I'd spent so much time in multipliers land that it, that mm -hmm. I think I was leaning towards a leadership book, um, and uh, and and it was some of the in in a sense it was some of the data that I'd come across that was contradictory to what I had found yeah. uh, before. Yeah. Um, but but as I was trying to get there with it, uh, I actually sort of couldn't get I either woke up in the middle of the night one time I just couldn't get to sleep I don't remember which now but I just kept feeling like no you're on the wrong thing this isn't the right path mm. and and I, again and again I kept feeling you're supposed to write this other book and the book at the time was called the story of clarity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and that's and that was and I just kept feeling it and finally by I couldn't get to sleep until I sort of agreed and made this decision I'm which going book? To do the story of clarity. Yeah, and that was the book to to go. So so you know so you can imagine any the, the I, I can't even I can't remember all the names. I wish yeah. I had them right now because that would be a fun conversation yeah. about the alternative words. Right. Uh, but but finally they they came together. They didn't come together until actually the book agent and I were talking about it, uh, and we just finally they just clicked into place. Yeah because um, you're right it is like naming that movement is such a huge decision and that's the title of the book and that's what people are going to talk about so i knew you had just toiled over what do we call this thing yeah, yeah. it's absolutely true there was yeah. tremendous effort i i have um i i mean I, I think this is true i mean in books in books generally i think there's a yeah. there's a bit of an error that's made uh with with not thinking deeply enough yeah. about the exactly the right title yeah. uh, and I think that's a lot to do with the fact that most books are passion projects for somebody mm -hmm. and so it's it, it's almost like within people because it means so much to them and because they can feel that it would be so powerful if people lived the thing that they're learning about that that is it seems like it's enough yeah. and so it, and so when it comes to the naming of the book it's almost like the last thing they think about it or it's a, or it's an afterthought or something and, and I I think you've got to be thinking about that right from the beginning because yeah. that is the first thing someone else will see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was intense. Yeah. It was actually an intense process. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, there's a lot of great stories in this book. I mean, you referenced Michael Phelps, Bob Bowman, Derek Sivers, Malcolm Gladwell. My personal favorite was the Cynthia story. That, for me, hit home in a huge way. Um, mm. Tell a little bit about that that particular story in the book? Well, it's the story, uh, it's the story of a, an 11 year old girl, yeah. uh, who, whose father took seriously his responsibilities to try and create great dates, yeah. uh, great experiences. He traveled a lot and, uh, and he was going to San Francisco one time. And so she was coming with him and they had planned for weeks and weeks in advance that they would go together and they had planned everything down to the detail of what they would do. He'd, he would speak at the conference till, you know, whatever, I don't remember now, four o'clock. And then right. from four o'clock, then they were going to go, uh, you know, down into China, down to, uh, to, to, to eat her favorite Chinese food. And then they were going to watch a movie. Then they were going to go back to the hotel, watch another right. flick, and then, you know, order room service, Sundays, everything. And they had lived that vision yeah. in advance, yeah. talking about it, envisioning it together. Uh, looking forward to it together. When the day came, when they were in San Francisco, yeah. uh, a, a, an old friend uh, comes up to them right after the conference and says, oh, I'm so glad that you're here. I brought my wife here together. You should come to our place tonight for a fa fabulous, uh, you know, like seafood dinner. dinner seafood yeah. dinner, yeah. you know, looking over the bay area, you know, looking over the bay and, and just, just totally describes this whole picture. Yeah. And Cynthia, the the eleven year old daughter, says just says you know she, she inside she didn't say anything outside it, but inside she just suddenly felt so deflated she can't stand the seafood she knows that it'll be adult conversation she's just barely a part of it yeah. uh, and then and all of a sudden she hears her father say oh no I would love to do that but it's absolutely impossible we've scheduled everything down to the to the last minute 
Mm. And he just grabs her hand and runs out. Yeah. Uh, and they continue it. Um, Cynthia told me that story uh, just a few weeks after uh, her father, Stephen, Stephen R. Covey, uh, died. Yeah. And, and she said, look, this, this, is, this is the number one story that I hold on to yeah. as I think about his life, yeah. is that in this moment, he actually chose me. He made yeah. the trade-off, uh, chose me yeah. over uh, over this uh, this old friend who who was there and definitely was trying to influence him. And yeah. uh, so that's a very touching story to me. Yeah, it was touching because I had to do some soul searching in that moment and think right. and think. I hope I would have made that same decision. Right. But would I have? You yes. know. And that's kind of scary to me. Like, would I have? So I'm glad you include that in the book because then when this occurs, which I'm sure it will, I have two daughters, I will grab their hand and go on that excursion. So, yeah. Well, I, I think in this, I think in this story, it, there's a variety of things going on in that story that yeah. I think are important. But, but one of them, uh, I mean, I actually talked to Stephen about that story. I knew about the story before and I talked mm. to him about it. And, and his whole point was, you, you know, you've got to have a clearer yes stronger yes burning inside of you if you yeah. want to say no in those moments. I mean, the key to the story isn't just yeah. his prioritization. It's that he really had a thorough plan. I mean, if, you, if you don't have a, a, a thorough plan at, at an organization, then you, the, your calendar gets filled up yeah. uh, with other things. You know, if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. The key is, is, is actually doing the work in the first place. Um, right. I mean, I, I just had an experience yesterday uh, with this, it was very surreal. So, so yeah, yesterday was my media day. So it was just appointment, back, appointment after appointment of interviews, and uh, and and I had failed to put to, to have my assistant put on my calendar some key event, which was uh, the winter sing at my son's school. Yeah. And he'd said to me a couple of days before that he really wanted me to go. Mm. And then when I checked the calendar, suddenly I'm like, oh. <laughs> there are all these people. Yeah, it's 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 quite an important day. They've been scheduled way in advance, way right. way in advance. Right, and it's my failure to have put this on. You know, to have protected that that window. Yeah, uh, in advance as I could have done. And uh, and and, uh, and and I, I want to come back to this point in a moment because yeah. Stephen Covey did does something that I uh, throughout his life that I think is key. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm on a call. You know, I'm having a conversation not unlike this one telling them about the story of the hospital story with my wife right as my wife waves to me to go to the winter sink and she's walking out the door and i had this very out of body moment of are you going to have a mini reliving of this right while you're telling somebody about what you learned right or are you going to make a different choice and there was a technical glitch on the phone right as that i was having that thought that just helped me to go oh just reschedule this. Just say, hey, listen. God came season. down and like struck the internet connection. <laughs> I, I, maybe, maybe, but it was just enough that I was like, this is an option. And, and, and actually, it, I just said, listen, I said, um, I said, you know, we're, we're a little rushed right now. Uh, let's, you know, would you like to schedule this at a time that, that was less rushed for you and I? Yeah. Yes, that's totally fine. Yeah. And it was in that case, I know, I know it's not always that easy, but in this yeah. case, it really didn't feel yeah. easy until... You say it, and then it was solved. And it is, I, I have now burned in my mind, and I don't think I will ever forget the image of us all, because all these two girls, my wife and I, go into this winter sing together, and we're there, and we're waving at him. And the look on his face mm. when he saw us, yeah. and he knew that they were all going to be there, but mm. I hadn't committed that I would be. Mm. If I had, if I promised my children anything, I will do it. Right, you know, right. Absolutely. So, yeah. so I make promises pretty sparingly and keep them pretty faithful, very faithfully, if I right. say I promise. But anyway, so he didn't ex expect that I would be there. But I just to see that moment, I thought, it's that moment versus having finished this interview, yeah. which was so you know easy to reschedule. Yeah. So it was a happy moment for me. I'm, I'm not in any way suggesting I always get this right now. But it was nice to not have the second fail and to not be sharing the fail story. Yeah. Today. Yeah. I'm not afraid to tell that. I'm not afraid to fail. I'm not afraid to admit my failings. I just am glad I don't have to tell that story today. Right. So we ha we're right at the time. Um, 
Greg, so I want to wrap up. And, but um, will you finish your thought about the Stephen Covey? You said you want to come back to the oh, Stephen yeah, Covey point. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's a great point. So, so what, he, what he did is he would schedule three years in advance. Get, get your head around that. I can't. Like on the yes. calendar. <laughs> yeah. So obviously you can't schedule everything three years in advance. I mean, that's, that's, that's right. And you don't want to be so inflexible either probably. But, yes. but he would be on the phone to the schools saying, look, what is the schedule? Not just for this whole year, but what about next year? Do you wow. have any of next year scheduled? And so that he could put as much of that on the calendar as possible, as mm. far in advance as possible. Yeah. And, and really that was the key. And so I actually already had a conversation with my, with, with my EA and just said, said, okay, here's what, what we're going to do. We're going to try and, we're going to try and, re- and copy that. Yeah. We're going to try and get all the, all the schedule with, with the school as far in advance as possible. And we're going to put all of it in the calendar. Uh, so that as we're scheduling keynotes or, or workshops or these or, or interviews, we're always protecting yeah. uh, that. Uh, we're always protecting that space. Yeah, Greg. So many more questions. No more time. I appreciate your time. Where should we point people towards to check out online? Um, look, I think I, I think the answer is uh, gregmcewan.com still. Yeah. Although, depending on when this is actually going live, yeah. uh, thisinc.co, thisinc.co yeah. is going to be a sort of sneak peek uh, as to as to what we're going to be rolling out in 2016. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, because That's we're not cool. ju- we're trying to do the social movement, but we're also trying to pr- pr- provide people with the capabilities and some of the tools yeah. uh, that would help people to do this inside of their teams and the organizations and so on. So. So you prefer thisinc.co, right? Okay. We'll link both of them up, but I, I want to put that in the lower okay. third for the whole interview. Um, I'm, an honor, I'm honored that you uh, did this. I know you're an essentialist, and so you had a lot of choices. So um, thank you for choosing and, and talking about this with Inspired Insider. Hey, Greg. My, it's, it's really my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the sand And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand